Welcome everyone. I call the September 26, 2023 Landmark Preservation Board meeting to order. The main purposes of tonight's meeting are the Elkington sm Smile signage and a public hearing on the nomination of the residents known as the McAdoo as the McAdoo House. Before we move on to the agenda items, I'd like to acknowledge our hybrid meeting format. The City of Bothell is providing the option to attend this meeting either in person or remotely via Microsoft Teams. For those participating via Teams, the chat and question functions are not available for use to ensure compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act. We have a public comment agenda item at the beginning of the meeting. This time is for comments on issues not on tonight's agenda. Please limit these comments to three minutes. We'll be using lights to signal available time. When the yellow light appears, com commenters will have 20 seconds to conclude. When the red light appears, time is up. Please note that the city of Bothell does not tolerate verbal harassment. Please remember this during your comments. Public comment and hearing testimony will be allowed both in person and via Teams. Those wishing, to, those wishing to comment via Teams were asked to submit an online form by 3 p.m. today. People wishing to submit written comment were also asked to submit those comments by 3 p.m. Email was encouraged as well and will be acknowledged. Those in attendance may also make comments and have been asked to indicate their desire to comment on the sign-in sheets. The city website and tonight's agenda provide information to the public for providing comments. A call -in number was provided on the meeting agenda for members of the public who wish to call in by phone to listen to the meeting, listen live to the meeting. For our phone and callers during staff presentation, staff will make every effort to specify which materials they are ref referencing so everyone can follow along. At this point, we will take a moment to acknowledge the attendance of the board members. Uh, Board Member uh, Swampy, Swampy. Here. Board Member Thomas. Here. Board Member Salazar. Here. I don't have our fifth member on this. But what is? I'm sorry. Um, no, that's okay. Um, it is Board, Rolfson, and I'm Board Member Arulf Jolie. And if I put your name, I apologize. And he I, is absent. He is absent, of course. Board Member Nelson is here. Thank you all. In addition, Community Development Director Jason Greenspan, Senior Planner Amanda Davis, and Community Engagement Specialist Sarah Frost from City Staff, as well as their consultant, Adam Allsbrook from, Wil from Williamette Cultural Resources and Associ Association, Association is here. Lastly, before we begin, I'd like to re reiterate some meeting guidelines. For all meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. And mute your microphone when not speaking. Before we, begin, before we begin, I would like to remind commenters that while you may speak to whatever topics you choose, we ask that if you are a council candidate, you do not use this time to speak to your, solely to your own campaign. Each person is solely responsible for their own comments, but speaking about your own campaign could be a violation of campaign laws, which the Public Disclosure Commission would determine. For, for board members, at the Pacific breaks in the presentation, I will be calling on members who wish to speak or to ask a question. If you wish to speak, please indicate by raising your hand. I will call you as I see as I see you. This will help avoid the problem of two people speaking at the same time. Please identify yourself before you ask a question, make a motion or second a motion, or participate in debate. And if you're online, please meet your microphone. Please meet your microphone when not speaking. The first item on the agenda is public comment. The city has accepted visitor comment in, in writing as well as written, as well as accepted sign up sheets for those who wish to speak at tonight's meeting. Written comments submitted to staff no later than 3 p.m. today are afforded to all board members and are part of the record. Um, Director Greenspan, is there, are there any comments? No. No comments. Gotcha. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, excellent. So it looks like old business, the Elkington Smile uh, mitigation package. Okay. Uh, shall we start with the staff report? That sounds good to me. Okay. Uh, 
uh, as uh, seen in the meeting agenda packet uh, that was posted online, the uh, as a reminder to the board um, at the May 23rd, 2023 meeting of the City of Bothell Landmark Preservation Board, the board remanded appro final approval of the signage of the interpreter signage to staff. And so uh, staff has reviewed uh, the the signage that was received by the applicant uh, on August 22nd, 2023. So the purpose of this on the agenda is the applicant submitted their final signage proposal in response to the board comments from the May 23rd, 2023 meeting of the board background. The applicant met with the board to negotiate alternatives to demolition for the Elkington Smile property on April the 26th, 2022, again on May the 24th, 2022, and again on October 25th, 2022. No alternative, excuse me, uh, missing phrase there, no alternative to demolition could be found, so the board assigned mitigation measures. During the board meeting on May the 23rd, 2023, the board asked the applicant to submit the final wording of the signage to staff for final review and approval. The staff recommendation is, staff recommends approval of the signage, signage proposal as submitted by the applicant on August the 22nd, 2023, and the attachments include the final signage proposal for the record. Um, and so this is uh, just information for the board, no vote or action required. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do we ask the applicant if they wish to speak to their application or is that not uh, necessary at this time. For the Elkington yeah. Smile? Yeah, since. I mean, I'm not familiar with this project, but so there's no action. Yeah. I mean, sure. I mean, if they, if they want to say a little something, sure, it's fine. It's just like an update. It's just an update, right? So yeah. we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just an update. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, you can ask Tyler up there if he'd uh, wish to say anything briefly, but he's not required to say anything if he doesn't wish to. Well, first off, Tyler, thank you for being here. And if you have anything that you wish to say, you may go ahead. Uh, well, the video kind of lagged and whatnot. As I understand it, um, final approval has been accepted and we're okay to proceed with, I guess, construction once we're ready. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, no, I don't have much to say. I'll make it short and sweet. I appreciate you guys' time and effort with this project. I know it obviously takes um, quite a bit of um, work on everyone's part. So um, that's that's all I have to say is thank you and I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay. I think that concludes that item of old business, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. So I presume that means we go to the public hearing? Uh, yes, that is correct. Excellent. So I'm assuming I read the. I'm assuming I read this Correct. before the presentation. Okay. Correct. Was well, everyone ready? <laughs> well, here in procedure, the purpose of tonight's public meeting is for the board to review and make a recommendation to be forwarded to the city council for the eligibility and addition of the McAdoo House located at 17823, 88th Avenue Northeast, Bothell, Washington, 98011, into the Bothell Register of Historic Historic Landmarks. This is a quasi judicial matter. I will first go over the order of operations for this ma for this matter. As this is a quasi judicial proceeding, we will begin with swearing in all witnesses w wishing to provide testimony. Then the city attorney will ask the board members the appearance of fairness questions. Following that city staff will present a report laying out tonight's proposal. 
the city staff will then read any written comments if received into the record if if received. From then, we will then hear from the proponent, proponents of the proposal. After, we will open a public hearing to take testimony from the public. Members of the public wishing to testify in this matter will have the opportunity to do so tonight. Testimony will be limited to 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, you will be asked to sit down and no extension of time will be provided. This will allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Staff will be tracking your time and will let you know when your 10 minutes are complete. Those wishing to testify but not using all of their 10 minutes may not donate their time to another individual wishing to testify. Please confine your remarks to the matters at hand. Any person becoming disruptive or unruly, unruly will be asked to leave this meeting. For all those testifying, please speak clearly and pause fre frequently. Please state your name prior to speaking. And if you are joining remotely, city staff will unmute your microphone when it is your op opportunity to testify. At the end of public testimony, staff and the project proponents will have the opportunity to present any rebuttal if applicable. At that point, the public hearing will be closed and the board will commence deliberations. So oath, oath administ administering. We will now store in the witnesses who will testify in these proceedings. Would all city staff, applicants, and other persons wishing to testify tonight please stand and raise your right hand? Question, does that include me? No. Oh. If there's and if there's anyone on the team, mm -hmm. they, they will need to unmute mm -hmm. and you know have their video on and so we can see them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If if there's anyone on teams who would like to make comment, yeah, right, so, and uh, be sworn in. Tom will have to be sworn in okay. as well. Okay. Go ahead and um, unmute your mic and <laughs> raise your digital hand. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone ready? Do you promise to tell the truth in these proceedings? If so, please respond with I do. I do. I do. That's everyone. Thank you. You may now be seated. Well, actually, uh, Penelope is going to be speaking as well, and she is here, so she should probably technically do that. As yes. Well. Yes. We can do it again. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and Penelope, if you are able to turn your camera on, awesome. Um, if not, we understand. <laughs> Hello, I have attempted to turn my camera on and my mic on, and I have my digital hand raised. <laughs> Brilliant. Yep. Can I just do it again? Then? Minister the oath, yes. Sure. Do you promise to tell the truth in these proceedings? If so, please respond, I do. I do. Excellent. Thank you so much. City Attorney, will you please ask each member of the board the appearance of fairness questions? I'm going to come up there to the table, the way the audio can capture. Oh, thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Ignore my water bottle. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to ask these each individually. Um, these are the appearance of fairness questions, since this is the quasi a quasi judicial proceeding. Um, does any particular board member want to go first? I guess I'll do it. Okay, Chair. Do you have any interest in the property or the application or own property within 300 feet of the property subject to the proposal tonight? No. Does your employer have an interest, financial or otherwise, in the outcome of this proceeding? No. Is there any prospective employment for you or a member of your family as a result of the outcome of this proceeding? No. Do you have any familial, social, or business relationships or connections with any of the parties or non-parties who have an interest in the outcome of this proceeding? No. Do you stand to gain or lose any financial benefit as a result of the outcome of this proceeding? No. Have you engaged in any ex parte communications with either proponents or opponents of this proposal? No. And then finally, can you hear and consider the proposal tonight in a fair and objective manner? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to go next? I'll go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Next. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Board Member Somfi, uh, do you have any interest in the property or the application or own property within 300 feet of the property subject to the proposal? Does your employer have an interest, financial or otherwise, in the outcome of this proceeding? 
Is there any prospective employment for you or a member of your family as a result of the outcome of this proceeding? Do you have any familial, social, or business relationships or connections with any of the parties or non-parties who have an interest in the outcome of this proceeding? Do you stand to gain or lose any financial benefit as a result of the outcome of this proceeding? No. Have you engaged in any ex parte communications with either proponents or opponents of the proposal? And then finally, can you hear and consider the proposal in a fair and objective manner? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Board member, do I go next? I will. Okay. And your board member Thomas for yes, the record? Excellent. Okay. Board member Thomas, do you have any interest in the property or the application or own property within 300 feet of the property subject to the proposal? No. Does your employer have an interest, financial or otherwise, in the outcome of this proceeding? No. Is there any prospective employment for you or a member of your family as a result of the outcome of this proceeding? No. Do you have any familial, social, or business relationships or connections with any of the parties or non-parties who have an interest in the outcome of this proceeding? Not that I know of, no. <laughs> Do you stand to gain or lose any financial benefit as a result of the outcome of this proceeding? Have you engaged in any ex parte communications with either proponents or opponents of the proposal? No. And then finally, can you hear and consider the proposal in a fair and objective manner? Yes. Okay. We have one last board member, board member Salazar. Correct. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, board member Salazar, do you have any interest in the property or the application or own property within 300 feet of the property subject to the proposal? No. Does your employer have an interest, financial or otherwise, in the outcome of this proceeding? No. Is there any prospective employment for you or a member of your family as a result of the outcome of this proceeding? No. Do you have any familial, social, or business relationships or connections with any of the parties or non-parties who have an interest in the outcome of this proceeding? No. Do you stand to gain or lose any financial benefit as a result of the outcome of this proceeding? No. Have you engaged in any ex parte communications with either proponents or opponents of this proposal? No. And finally, can you hear and consider the proposal tonight in a fair and objective manner? Yes. Thank you. That is all the board members. Thank you so much. Thank you again, City Attorney, for being here and for doing that. Does anyone in attendance wish to challenge the participation of any board member based on fair based on appearance of fairness doctrine? If so, please raise your hand either in person or virtually. Seeing none. Seeing none. Excellent. Okay. So would that mean I just go to? Uh, that's what I thought. Thank you. <laughs> that was simple and easy. Great. We will now ask city staff to please present their staff report on the proposal. Okay. My favorite part. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Tom. Are you there? Do you have to unmute him or yes. can he unmute himself? OK, Tom, thank you very much. Thank you for thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we had a we had a, a few uh, little uh, technology uh, glitches, totally my fault. Um, and so uh, we are going to be viewing uh, a PowerPoint presentation uh, that uh, Tom uh, and Penelope uh, prepared. Um, before we uh, launch into the staff report. Uh, Tom, could you please introduce yourself first, uh, followed by Penelope? Yes, hi, I am uh, Tom Heuser. I am an architectural historian with uh, Willamette Cultural Resources Associates. All right, thank you, Tom. Penelope? Hi there, I'm Penelope Cottrell Crawford, and I'm also an architectural historian for Willamette Cultural Resources Associates. OK, thank you so much. And then just for the benefit of uh, both the uh, board members and also the audience that we have uh, coming in online, uh, my name is Adam Alsabrook. I am senior architectural historian at Willamette Cultural Resources Associates. 
uh, and uh, heading the Willamette Cultural Resources Associates team, uh, administering the Historic Preservation Program on behalf of the city of Bothell. Um, Tom and Penelope uh, were the stat, they were the staff members who wrote the, just for some additional context before we go into the report, Tom and Penelope wrote the landmark nomination uh, for the McAdoo House. You know, after the applicant uh, uh, nominated their property, you know, there were some deliberations back and forth um, between city staff uh, and, you know, community development, and ultimately the decision was made. Uh, and due to the extraordinary significance of the McAdoo House, uh, that the nomination would be pre be prepared by the consultant uh, on behalf uh, prepared by the consultant on behalf of the, nom the nominator. Uh, and so, in this case, it is the current owners of the property who have nominated it. Uh, they currently live in Zimbabwe. Uh, they uh, told me today that they. Uh, would have loved to have joined, but it is uh, three <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. three thirty in the morning in Zimbabwe, and so uh, they um, they uh, would Decline. not would they they declined to attend. <laughs> so just wanted to give a little bit of background on that. At this time, uh, Tom, uh, uh, unfortunately, we'll have to do it the old school way. So when you need the slide advanced, please say so, and Sarah will advance the slide. But if you could launch into your presentation. Fine, sir. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, so first, just kind of the, the basic points. We, uh, the address is 17823 88th Avenue Northeast in Bothell, or West Hill neighborhood. Uh, historic name McAdoo House, common name Braxton House. ESC and modern style uh, builder was Edwin L. Dahlbeck, architect obviously Benjamin F. McAdoo Jr. Landscape architects, architects Edward Watanabe and Fred Ray. Significant occupants were the Max, uh, the McAdoo and Braxton uh, Johnson families. And then just some notable features, the attached carport, planting areas, uh, the patio, wood bridges, wood sun decks, the false moat and floating appearance of the house. Uh, and then some notable changes pre-2007, the driveway expansion and circa 2020 replacement of the rear decks. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, there. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, and then uh, just the applicable criteria. We'll we'll start after I finish this intro. We'll start with criterion D, which Penelope will will go through, uh, and which is the property embodies the distinctive architectural characteristics of a type, period, style, or method of construction or represents a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction. Uh, and then criteria, criterion B, which I will be covering, the property is associated with the lives of persons significant in local, state, or national history. And the areas of significance are architecture, community planning and development, and ethnic heritage. And the period of significance would be 1958 to 1962. Okay, I will pass it off to Penelope. Great, thank you, Tom. So uh, I will go through a physical description of the property and then, as he mentioned, the architectural significance and then pass it back on, on to Tom after that. So the um, residence is a single story ranch house that was designed in built in 1958, as we mentioned, by Benjamin McAdoo Jr. in the Mijian modern style. Uh, with collaboration with um, Edward Watanabe and Fred Ray and builder Edwin Dalbeck. The uh, house stands on a rectangular 0.6 acre parcel that uh, has one building and attached carport and two sheds. The parcel is bounded by residential parcels on three sides and by 88th Avenue Northeast to the east. The building itself is surrounded by uh, historic aged conifer trees, many of which were already marked as existing in the architect's 1958 drawings, as well as open grass lawn with a couple non-historic ornamental trees. An asphalt driveway leads from the street and widens to form a parking area and driveway loop in front of the carport and patio. The topography of the site is generally defined by a slope down from east to west that is from front to rear and an earthwork berm that occupies the north edge of the property. Next slide, please. 
The building itself is mostly rectangular in shape with a couple idiosyncrasies that I'll discuss. Uh, the primary entrance faces east, so that top picture is the front of the house. A cantilevered wing projects 10 feet further east from that front elevation, and on the rear side, another cantilevered room projects about six feet further west from that rear elevation. The ground floor extends past the basement footprint on the north and the south elevations, making a, foot, a four foot wide overhang. The partially exposed poured concrete basement walls are visible on all elevations. A built-in double carport constructed on a concrete slab is attached to the roof at the northeast corner of the house, about 10 feet away from the building. And that is, you can see in the right hand side of the top photograph. Next slide, please. Here we see two wood frame storage sheds that are built into the carport, um, both on the west end of the carport. Next slide. The building is primarily clad in vertical cedar siding. A uh, secondary cladding is common bond brick veneer. And this is present on the chimney along the east elevation of that projected wall, uh, as well as brick privacy wall under the carport and a low wall that defines that front patio that's visible in the center photograph. The house's roof is flat and built up. There are no eaves on the majority of the walls, with the exception of the carport and the rear deck, which are sheltered by wide projecting eaves with cedar soffits supported by large wood beams and twin wood posts in the carport area that are built to appear as if floating just slightly off the ground. Next slide. The windows of the residence are characterized by floor length fixed aluminum windows, as well as uh, what I call Mondrian style fixed aluminum windows. Uh, you see there's a painting by Pete Mondrian for reference of what that entails. It's essentially a square pane of glass with a horizontal ribbon of two or three rectangular panes. This style of window is replicated around um, various elements of the house. Next slide. The south elevation of the building has no window apertures and the partially exposed basement is outfitted with horizontal ribbons of sliding windows along the east and the west elevations. Next slide. A linear patch of ground is cut 10 feet wide between the building footprint and the surrounding landscapes to the east and the north. And this forms what McAdoo described as a moat in his architectural drawings. It's one of the most interesting, um, in my opinion, features of this uh, design of this house. Uh, and we'll go through it a little bit piece by piece here. The moat is cut at 200 feet above sea level at grade with the rear yard and is lined with gravel. The L shape is defined by the east and the north basement walls and by parallel concrete retaining walls that support the higher ground. One retaining wall extends past the northeast corner of the building. Another retaining wall intersects it at a right angle and extends the moat along the north berm and terminates at a concrete steps that provide access to that rear yard. Next slide. Here you can see those concrete steps and the berm uh, with a couple different perspectives to give you a sense of the size of that burn and its relationship with the flat rear yard. Next slide. Returning to the front of the house, two bridges are constructed across McAdoo's moat. The, norther the northernmost is pictured here. It's a wood bridge about three feet wide that allows access across the moat from the carport to the kitchen. We see a little built-in wood screen that affords some privacy. Next slide. This is a wider wood bridge that's about six feet wide that provides access from the carport to the main house entrance. Next slide. The projecting east wing of the bedroom is cantilevered over the, over the moat. You can see there's a gap in the um, space below that square window, and that is the cantilevered wing. Uh, next slide, the negative spaces that are created by all of this, the cantilevered bedroom and the two entry bridges. These spaces are planted with ornamental bamboo and Japanese maple, next slide. Uh, and the presence of these plantings um, accentuate the building's designed integration of outdoor and indoor spaces, next slide, as well as the building's horizontality within the landscape. Next slide. Um, alterations to the residence, uh, as Tom mentioned at the beginning, occurred in the past two decades and are limited to the rear elevations and a portion of the driveway. 
Prior to 2007, the footprint of the asphalt driveway was slightly expanded. And in circa 2020, the original rear decking was removed and replaced with one contiguous deck. A west door was also removed and replaced and some protective railing was added to the northern moat walls. Next slide. The McAdoo House is eligible for listing on the Bothell Register of Historic Landmarks under Criterion D, specifically for its significance as an embodiment of distinctive characteristics of a flat roof ranch house in, uh, designed in the median modern style. And it possesses high artistic value in its siding and design and is an exceptional example of Benjamin McAdoo Jr.'s skilled workmanship. Next slide. Just a little synopsis about um, Mijian modernism. The Mijian style is named after Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, pictured in the center here. Uh, he's often referred to though by the single surname Mies. He started in European avant-garde architecture, directed Bauhaus School of Design in Berlin until the 1930s, after which he went on to become a prominent architect and academic in Chicago, leading the Illinois Institute of Technology School of Design and developing a national reputation for a distinctly modern architectural style. Mies worked on many scales of design, but the style that he's known for is united by um, characteristics such as features that give the building a weightless quality and a horizontal look. Windows in his designs, for example, occupy large swaths of, lar of wall space, or they are continuous horizontal ribbons. He's also known for a use of flat slab roofs, either with large exposed eaves over doorways and decks, or with no overhang at all. And he's known for an employment of recessed shadows at the base of the walls, or of cantilevering to create the look or appearance of a floating structure. Next slide. As you can see, McAdoo's design and execution of the house is a thoughtful use of these Nisian elements, and the building continues to evoke this original design intent and continues to possess these high artistic values in the siding. Recent alterations that I described before have not impeded the character defining elements of the house, such as the exposed basement, the overhangs, cantilevered elements, the windows, roof design, the moats, and the bridges, nor have they impacted the general floating effect that the building envelopes um, has. So ultimately, the McAdoo House therefore possesses integrity of location, design, materials, and workmanship to the period of significance. And its continued use as a single family residence lends it integrity of association. So the McAdoo House possesses all five aspects of integrity and is able to fully communicate its architectural significance. And I'll pass it back on to Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Penelope. All right, so now I will uh, touch on some of the highlights of uh, McAdoo's extensive background and career. Um, skipping over some of these items because there's there's a lot to get through. Uh, so he was born in Oct on October 29th, 1920 in Pasadena, California. And notably, his father, Benjamin McAdoo Sr., founded a successful hardwood flooring business and worked with prominent LA architects, which may be where McAdoo developed his interest in architecture. And uh, he was active at church during this time, uh, during his, uh, his youth and uh, gave speeches and sermons, which really informs his later uh, political activities, which I'll get to in a bit. And uh, he went on to earn his bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Washington in 1946. And while there, he was a part of a club of architects interested in changing the world. Next slide, please. Ah, sorry. OK. <laughs> um, and uh, next we have a here is a brief outline of his architectural career, starting as the first licensed black architect in Washington state in October of 1946. And uh, he briefly worked for uh, James Shirelli and Paul Kirk, and then uh, went into private practice through the end of 1961. And then after that, he took on both national and international work with the US government through roughly about 1969 and then uh, returned to solely private practice work out of his Seattle office after that until his death in 1981. And overall, he designed single and multifamily homes as well as religious, institutional, and commercial buildings. And he earned multiple Home of the Month awards 
and frequently other forms of recognition for his work. Next slide, please. And now on to his uh, civil rights advocacy and political activities. Uh, most notable, he was a 1954 candidate for Democratic uh, State Representative of the 37th District under the campaign slogan, McAdoo will work for you. Unfortunately, we don't know what his actual uh, uh, positions were, but uh, that's that's what remains. And um, he was also the first African-American delegate to uh, the Dem Democratic National Convention in 1956. He was a longtime political commentary on KUOW radio in the 1970s. And he challenged and spoke out on police brutality, unfair labor practices, race relations and crime, and advocated for education, mass transit, equal housing, among other things. Next slide, please. Now I'll briefly go over some examples of McAdoo's work to demonstrate his broad knowledge and often cutting edge expertise, starting with his single family home designs. Uh, exemplary and outstanding examples include the Wrightian style Shane residence on the upper left there with its especially broad horizontals and heavy overhanging eaves, and then some of which carries over into the more airy and open Mia, um, uh, Mission style Morehouse residence with its splint entry on the upper right. And then there's his uh, 620 to 700 square foot economy homes of the early 50s, some of which were deemed houses of merit and others the first real economy home of the post-war period. And over 100 of these were reportedly built throughout Seattle. And then at the lower left, you have the Coors residence, which appears to anticipate the shed style of architecture by over 10 years ahead of its time. It has some very similar elements to that. And lastly, on the lower right, you have the Greenberg uh, residence, which was more of a typical ranch type house. Uh, some uh, various uh, variations of that that uh, McAdoo often design as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then we have uh, his multifamily buildings. Uh, first among them is the uh, Ben Mar Apartments, named after his two first children, because this uh, was constructed before uh, before Enid McAdoo was born. And uh, what's particularly uh, outstanding about this building is that it not only did McAdoo own and operate the building, but he offered unrestricted tenancy, and that was widely uh, published. Uh, and made known. And there were a few other buildings in Seattle at the time that did the same thing. So kind of blazing that trail and trying to change um, housing access. And also what's kind of cool about this one is that it appears ahead of its time uh, for offering private balconies, which uh, and having studied a lot of multi-family multi mid-century buildings on Capitol Hill, uh, balconies did not become a thing until the late 50s. So he was very ahead of his time in that as well. And uh, a lot of these uh, multifamily buildings were they were designed with affordability in mind, uh, tended to be smaller units and very, you know, just kind of the basic uh, necessities. And then otherwise you have a couple of other uh, solid end wall motel style buildings. Uh, you got one on the upper right and on the lower left. And then uh, a more curious apartment building that he designed later on with a more commercial looking curtain wall from 1960, which provides a convenient segue to McAdoo's Bothell highlights. Next slide, please. In which we see on the lower right, his curtain wall uh, apartment looks very similar to his design of the Marshall Paris building in Bothell, uh, which was also completed in 1960 and housed his office. And Despite his strong ties and success in Seattle, uh, McAdoo chose Bothell to establish his new office and home because he saw promise in Bothell as an upcoming place where an architect could grow with the community. And in his own words, it ultimately came down to the friendliness of the people we had met in the community, as a direct quote. And uh, the friendliness of people such as Bothell native and automobile dealer, uh, Ronald S. Green, who lived in Bothell and whose home McAdoo later designed, which is in the upper left there, as well as renowned architect Paul Hayden Kirk, McAdoo's former place, uh, employer, who had also lived in Bothell since at least 1950. Uh, and then other known works in Bothell include the uh, First Baptist Church at 19527 104th Avenue Northeast in 1960, which is now a part of Cross Point Church. 
and the flat roof and pool addition to the Sundstrom residence at 10727 Northeast 187th Street in 1969. Next slide, please. And then here we have uh, front and rear views of the house from 1962. Uh, next slide, please. And now I'll look inside the home. Uh, we have uh, just included here a studio portrait of the McAdoo family beside a couple views inside the home as it appeared in 1962 as well. Uh, first, in the upper left, we have a view of the backyard from the family room with its unique indoor barbecue pit on the, at the, on the left hand side there and a view also of the living room uh, on the lower left uh, with a sliding shoji screen. Uh, you can see that all the way in the back, which doubled as a stage curtain for live performances the McAdoo's hosted in their home. Uh, and these particular spaces are were likely where the McAdoo's would have also hosted their international guests in the home, such as Ghana's U.S. Ambassador Daniel Chapman and press attache uh, of the Ghana Embassy in Washington, D.C., Robert Mensa in 1958. Uh, these men and several others discussed the possibility of McAdoo starting a branch office in Ghana to help develop Ghana following its recent independence from the British Empire in 1957. Uh, despite the meeting culminating in multiple visits to Ghana, plans unfortunately never materialized. However, this is likely how McAdoo got connected to other national and international opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, such as his work as the lead architect on the concrete modular housing in Jamaica in 1960, late 1961 into 1962, which was a successful U.S. foreign aid program that produced two houses per day. And then he also worked as the coordinating architect on the John F. Kennedy Performing Arts Center in Washington, D.C., and the National Fisheries Center and Aquarium, which was never built. Next slide, please. And then here's just a couple of institutional highlights uh, that he did later in his career. He designed the South Center branch of the King County Central Blood Bank in 1970 and the University of Washington Ethnic Cultural Center in 1972, which also kind of has a uh, shed style to it. And next slide, please. And then uh, back to Seattle, uh, the McAdoo's resumed living at and renovating the combination office apartment on Capitol Hill uh, that they've had that they had since the 1950s. They did that. They returned in 1980 and then uh, McAdoo unfortunately passed away on June 15th, 1981. Uh, next slide, please. And then as an honorable mention, uh, definitely have to mention the uh, Braxton Johnson family and uh, who owned and occupied the house from 1962 up until uh, this year. So we have uh, Freddie Braxton, uh, her, her sister, uh, Dorothy Johnson, and her brother-in-law, Clifford C.P. Johnson. Uh, they were career public educators who dedicated their lives to their work and the children they taught and made a significant impact on the community. Braxton was one of Seattle Public School's first African-American teachers who taught physical education education and was an activity coordinator. Uh, Dorothy worked in special education for the Shoreline School District. Her outstanding work earned her national recognition from President Lyndon Johnson, the state of Washington, and the Washington Education Association. And finally, uh, CP was minority studies coordinator for the North Shore School District, which includes Bothell, and was also politically active. And uh, North, the North Shore School District uh, established their C.P. and Dorothy Johnson Humanitarian Award in 1989. And uh, the three of these folks uh, and, and their descendants, uh, as I said, yeah, I'm just reading right off my notes here. They, they first purchased the house in 1962, and uh, it's been in the family ever since. And um, one other note is that uh, Dorothy and Clifford came to Seattle in 1958 prior to them purchasing the house to help uh, Freddie raise uh, her children children after uh, Freddie had divorced from her husband uh, earlier on. And so, uh, yeah, the next slide, please. And now coming back to uh, the criterion discussion, uh, the McAdoo House is associated with the lives of persons significant in local, state, and in national history in this case. Uh, 
first with through Benjamin F. McAdoo Jr., who was an outstanding architect and uh, outstanding and prolific architect who fought tirelessly for civil rights, housing access, and who was the first black architect registered in Washington State, as well as Freddie Marie Braxton, Dorothy Johnson, Clifford P. Johnson, career educators who made a significant impact on the community. In the areas of significance are community planning and development, ethnic heritage, and the period of significance we set is 1958-62. Next slide, please. And just really quickly showing once again this slide for criteria and D. Uh, next slide, please. And that is it. And just many thanks to uh, the Braxton and McAdoo families for contributing to this nomination and for uh, the board members who uh, made it tonight. And so we reached quorum. So glad we could present this. And uh, so now I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Well, I thought that was a cool presentation. So I just want to put that out there. But um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No problem. I wanted to ask, this is Certainly. totally recorded, right? Yes. Yes. So it's part of the public record. Correct. Great. You bring, up, you, bring up, presentation. Thank you. you bring up a good point. Are there any questions or comments about the presentation that anyone on the board would like to ask? I think it was pretty thorough. I think that looked great, really. You did a great job. Oh, city staff, are there any um, written comments received? Yes. So there is one letter. Uh, I've got a copy of it. You Correct. Oh, good. I was like, um, I know I have. Oh, it. wait a minute. No, I'm going to have to. Do you have it? Do you mind if I read it from your computer? Totally. <laughs> uh, yes, it's actually that one. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Arrived at the same time. All right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The following letter is on the letterhead of Doko Momo US WIWA, which stands for Documentation and Conservation of the Modern Movement. This is the Western Washington chapter of that organization. This letter is dated September the 25th, 2023, addressed to the Bothell Landmarks Preservation Board, care of Adam Alsabrook. Uh, in regard to support for nomination of McAdoo House. Dear members of the Landmarks Preservation Board, Dokomomo U.S. WIWA, Documentation and Conservation of the Modern Movement, Western Washington, strongly supports the nomination of the McAdoo House as considered during the September 26, 2023 meeting. We are an all-volunteer nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness and appreciation of modern design in Western Washington. The McAdoo House is a vital part of the mid-century design context in the Pacific Northwest, representing the outstanding life and work of the architect and original owner, Benjamin F. McAdoo, Jr. As the first black architect to gain licensure in Washington State, McAdoo was instrumental in expanding the impact of modern design in the Pacific Northwest, bringing high-quality design to people in diverse communities and from a variety of economic backgrounds. As his career developed, McAdoo took on social activism, political service, international work for the federal government, in addition to his continued design career. McAdoo's persistent optimism, ambition, and willingness to help other people made him a pillar of the Northwest design community. In designing his own house, McAdoo used expressed structure in, uh, in the bypass columns and beams that define the carport and back deck, and a variety of spatial conditions in the different levels and shifting rooms and plan to create a remarkably simple but stunning house. The house reflects McAdoo's education in the Department of Architecture at the University of Washington and influence of his early internship in the office of noted modernist Paul Kirk. Yet the house also shows McAdoo defining his own approach to modernism in the Pacific Northwest, modest and impactful. This is an extremely important building in the history of modernism in the Pacific Northwest, and it should be preserved. Let me know if you have any further questions. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Sincerely signed, Tyler S. Sprague, past president, board of directors. Thank you, Vicki. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Did you move on? Yes. Is that the only letter? Yes. The only letter, yes. Project, project applicant has an opportunity to speak. Do we ask for comment, for verbal comment? So that will be coming later. Yes, for the chair's script. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the project applicant, uh, if they'd like to speak on the proposal, you, you have 10 minutes to do so. My understanding is, is the applicant is not present. Yeah. Okay. Due to a times. Uh, yeah, that would make times, sense. Yes. That would make sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Owner. That is yes. correct. Bob that is correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm still going to ask for public testimony. Excellent. Excellent. The public hearing for the eligibility in addition of the McAdoo House located at 17823 88th Avenue Northeast, Bothell, Washington, 98011 into the Bothell Register of Historic Landmarks is now open. We, we will now ask for members of the public to, pres to, pr to present, testi present testimony. Excuse me. Members of the public, if you wish to testify, please raise your physical hand or if joining remotely, please raise your virtual hand. City staff will call on all of those with hands raised until all of those who wish to testify have done so. Please remember to state your name, confine your remarks to the matters at hand, and that you have a time limit of 10 minutes. City staff will alert you when your time limit has expired. Now, do we have anybody who would like to do that? Seeing none. Okay. So board members. Just a friendly reminder. Yes. To, you've opened the public hearing, so oh. that would be appropriate to close the public hearing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I now close the public hearing. Is there any rebuttal from the applicant or staff? See none. Board members, is there any discussion of this matter or questions for staff, the proponents? or those testifying. I thought it was well explained. I mean, but also, uh, yeah, no, I think it looked, looked, looked good to me. I'll say it again, though. Does anyone have any questions uh, for staff, the proponents, and or those testifying? Seeing none. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Any board discussion yet? Uh, this is uh, just queries okay. you know so like you know just you know if if anything's unclear you know uh in the presentation or any of the facts as presented so board votes on a recommendation to council does anyone wish to make a motion uh, so there are also welcome to have yes yes sure, let's do this can, can, oh okay so we can discuss. have yes yes no. One question in terms of a motion is the motion related to. So on the, yeah, I have it on. This forward or. I saw there's a screen these. Yeah, so there's actually uh, there are four there are four draft motions. Right. Uh, and. I knew there was more than one. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so procedurally, uh, there are there's text for four draft motions. Uh, because, you know, per the Bothell Municipal Code, Title 22, uh, the the board can approve, approve with conditions, deny, or ask for more information. Basically, you know, it's like tabling, you know, just in a different sense of words. And so I have, uh, I've written draft motions along with findings of fact uh per yeah because it's a it, it's, it's, com it's complicated <laughs> <coupled them together. laughs> right right and so Thank there you. yeah there is a there is a draft script that's available to the board members that is it's a combination of two things first and foremost is the motion you know so that you have a motion to vote on and then secondly you have what are the what are known as the findings of fact 
And the findings of fact comprise the recommendation that goes to the Bothell City Council, because ultimately it'll be the Bothell City Council that will designate the, you know, the, it's, the fi it's the final legal hurdle. Right. Um, and so the city council will act on that recommendation. Um, and so does everybody have the script of the draft motions? Because I've got an extra one. Okay. Here is one and we're going to. I can look on. Yeah, we can share. Oh, there's, there's a, I think there's another one. Writing a document, is, as, you know, as a group. Right. Exactly. Is it appropriate to ask if this this is going to City Council for the Bothell Registry? Uh, does the applicant want to pursue state and national? It is unclear at this time. Uh, the only thing that has been discussed so far by the applicant is the desire to have the local landmark, um, and the reason. The reason for that, um, you know, as the members of the board know, is that the local the local historic designation in this case, the the registry on the Bothell Register of Historic Landmarks has protections. The National Register of Historic Places is generally honorary in the vast majority of cases, unless there's federal permitting or funding involved. And so that is uh, that is the was paramount. Yeah, that is that is correct. That is correct. Do we have any idea of the intent of the owners? The property is currently vacant. The the property is actually for sale. Uh, and my understanding from the real estate listing uh, today is that there is a pending contract. Um, on the on the property. So this would go okay. Uh, assuming we approve this, mm -hmm. which we're most likely to do, will this go before the council like right away? Or it has to go within 120 days. I know. That's why I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why I asked the question. <laughs> well, uh, hmm. I guess. Seems a little bit odd to me that a seller is getting the designation. Is the buyer aware of, or uh, engaged with the process, or the it, the way that it has been explained to the city and to me as the city's consultant is is that the prospective buyer is aware of the process and supports it. There have been two interested parties that have contacted the city about this property. And do we know the intent of either of the parties? No, we do not. Is that pertinent? <laughs> not generally. <laughs> you know, that's, but, that's kind of how that's usually answered. Yeah. Um, yeah. And does the designation impact the city in any way? Uh, no, no. Uh, the, the restrictions on the property are incumbent on the property owner, you know, whomever that particular property owner is, you know, be it someone. And who, those restrictions are, are limited to the exterior of the property is that correct so the uh the way that it is that staff recommends you know which the board you know can discuss you know because you you can move to condition um it, sorry just as an aside could you please send the draft motion text could you email that to yes. uh board member salazar please yes just to make sure that he has that for consideration too um the Currently, as, as staff recommends it, uh, it is a designation under criterion B and criterion D in that the property uh, possesses sufficient integrity to convey its historic significance uh, under the Bothell Municipal Code and that the limits of the designation are the tax parcel 
which uh, the number is spec the address and number of the tax parcel are stated in here and the exterior of the house. And so that is how it is currently disposed. There have been interior alterations, you know, as uh, you know, you know, as you read the nomination document, you know, there have been interior alterations over time. To the best of my knowledge, there are currently uh, 16 properties or they're either buildings or sites or objects uh, that are listed in the Bothell Register of Historic Landmarks. And of those 16, uh, none of them have an interior feature that is protected. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's it's mostly not appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. And so the red the recommendation. Is, oh. Here's a here's a it might be a silly question when I ask it for a potential buyer of this. Is there any downside for them if we put this on our registers or anything? And again, that might be a silly question, but um, would there be a reason for a buyer to say, hey, I don't want this on the register? And, then, and again, if it's not even an answerable question, that's fine, too. I just. Yeah, it's, you know, definitely, you know, it has been an unusual process. Um, you know, the. Uh, the best. Information that we have is that we're, you know, acting on the intent, yeah. you know, of the current property owner no, I get it. I with, get it. yeah, with the tacit understanding that the, that the prospective, you know, purchaser is aware of it. You know, it's going on. Yeah. So that's, that's the important yeah. part to me. It's but, going on, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I think that I'm glad they brought this forward to us. I think it's really cool. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and really, you know, just kind of the, the, the unusualness of the process is just kind of underscores the, you know, rather extraordinary sig significance of the property. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. yeah. So, you know, uh, that's the best I can kind of address no, that. No, that's, no, that's, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that answers my question. Yeah, so thank good. you so much. I mean, the presentation cited many properties. Yes. Uh, residential, commercial, multifamily. Um, do we know the extent of preservation designations to any of those properties? Within, oh. within Washington State. Oh, um, uh, if I may, uh, I need to confer with my colleague uh, if if that's allowed. Uh, Tom, uh, did you hear the question? Yeah, if I understand that correctly, you're asking whether any of his other works have been uh, landmarked. Correct. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm not aware. Yeah, and and so thank you for refreshing my memory because I think that's that's another one of the reasons why Docomomo in particular uh, has been you know very interested in this, as is also um, the uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, so the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. Yeah, and no, I think it makes our, our yeah. decision much more significant. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I mean, well, it real, yeah. It, I mean, if there were 20 does. properties of the state <laughs> that are already designated and protected, it, it, then it, I'd, I'd want to know what's the significance of this one in relationship to those. Certainly, certainly. But it's pretty if there's none, property. I think it's pretty significant to start the ball rolling. Yeah. Because this seems like a, you know, uh, I think what's significant, though, is uh, when we came home in 90, we'd, we'd been out of the state for 10 years, and I had just graduated from architecture school. And there was the under murmur about, are we going to save any of these? Right. And not just are we going to save any of them. Hey, by the way, that was the first time I heard about Magadie. And... That was in the Seattle Times. They were mm -hmm. writing him up, and they said, "You know, he's been here. He's doing all this." And and it, and it isn't just him. It's people who work for him, with him, at the university. There's there's a volume of this work out here, and to the best of my knowledge. I haven't heard that much of it's being preserved. 
the the I, I would say that the you know among the successes you know because I think that you know scholars have only just you know architectural historians and other scholars have only just really um, delved into this, um, but it, I mean definitely tooting the horn of Tom and Penelope, uh, um, you know who, you know took this project and ran with it um, and and you know wrote researched and wrote it in less than a month, um, uh, just really did an amazing job and, and, you know, did a very exhaustive search, uh, of, pro of the known McAdoo designs. And there's, there's a lot of interest. There's a, there's a lot of interest, uh, and justifiably so, um, you know, very, very talented architect. Um, there were a number of similar homes to this mm -hmm. in the market district uh, down in Kirkland. Mm. And there's yeah. only a very small handful left. And the only reason I know that is my sister and my brother and sister-in-law live in one of them. Well, that's architectural, architectural significance, but I, I like the, the historic significance of him being... Um, exactly. That's what, I, that's what I think is the... Even more to me personally, that's what's more important. The book, the architectural side of it is also very significant too. But the historical part of, of what he's done for this area, mm -hmm. and um, activist and NAACP, NAACP president and all the he's, he's done a lot. So I think that yeah. you know, I'll say for for, for myself, for myself, I'm in the um, approval category. I mean, we we can you know speak for myself. Sure. Question. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I think you mentioned uh, in the presentation uh, a couple of other sites in Bothell. Is that? Oh yes. Have yes. that correct? Yes. Yeah, that that is correct. Yes. Yes. And um, does your map happen to show where those are located? I have some suspicions, but. <laughs> Uh, uh, unfortunately not. Bottle. That's a great idea we, for we the need future. to check on the greenhouse. We we do know where the greenhouse is. Uh, so we've got the location of the greenhouse. The greenhouse is actually in the Bothell inventory, which means that it's been surveyed. Um, yeah, that only means that it's been I, surveyed. It's not no, been mentioned. I, right. I'm only saying it because I knew Ron Green. Oh. And uh, he was one of the first people that we worked with when we came came home and we worked with him at Scouts. And uh, yeah, you know, I remember visiting the house once, just you know, to pick up my husband because <laughs> he was right. over there. But um, he was significant to the city as well as you could look at the residents on both of those levels. Okay, to the to the best of our knowledge, uh, the Ron Green residence is still in existence uh, as of August. Um, the also the the Sundstrom residence, which you know there was an addition that was made to it, and a pool a pool that was added to it. So the Green residence is at one eight three three four ninety fourth Avenue Northeast. It was constructed in nineteen sixty. The Sundstrom residence is one zero seven two seven Northeast one eighty seventh Street. Those are up by the Rockwell Methodist mm -hmm. Church. Yeah, I've been in the Sundstrom residence too. And then Bothell First Baptist, uh, 19520, excuse me, sorry, 19527, 104th Avenue Northeast, 1960. It's Cross Point Church. It has been highly modified, uh, you know, and it's very visible from the road. And Mar the Marshall Paris building at 18041 Bothell Way Northeast, 1960, which was demolished in 2014. And it could be, this is just one of those add-ons, though, that we can do some of what we had as, instead of just doing plaques for some of the buildings that we wanted to call attention to, we could do, the Landmark Board can do our own interpretive signs. And we used to have the trail downtown that we kept up with the brochures. We can start to add some of these types of buildings to it. Is that the town gown loop? Yep. As well as on the corners, the little plaques on the corners that have the, the little fly, flyers to say, hey, you know, this was here and it was important. Because with 
encouraging people to get out and walk if we give them something to look at when they walk by. You know, and just to kind of speak, you know, just very briefly, just in summary, to the point of the known, there are, of course, going to be unknowns. Um, and so that's why we're proceeding very carefully anytime we've got something that's that's built in this mid-century modern time period is, you know, the the city's permit records don't go back that far. Um, but there's other ways that we can kind of suss out these details on some of these properties, but we're very reliant. Staff is very reliant on the anecdotal information that members of the public can bring to bear, um, particularly in upcoming survey efforts. It's like it's probably time that we consider doing a resurvey. Um, you know, that we've lost properties. You know, every, everybody knows that we have. Um, so th that's something that, uh, you know, staff is available for, you know, further discussion, you know, with the board. Um, because, it, you know, there are uh, undoubtedly additional McAdoo, you know, projects. I, I can think of two, mm. two uh, in my neighborhood. That you either suspect or know uh, for certain. Well, I'm very, I, I suspect very strongly. Yeah. So, you know, I would say, you know, things that we can, you know, if research. Not, yeah. They are very good mid century modern. Okay. So, just three. Were, you, were you able to uh, send that to uh, Board Member Salazar? I did. Okay. Okay. So, then we can. Board Member Salazar, can you just confirm whether or not you received the options via email? I did. Thank you. Sweet. Thanks. I, I don't. I personally don't see any reason to put conditions on this. I think we can approve it without. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm pushing towards that way too. I'm not okay. Maybe I'll defer to Adam. Yes. So the conditions we've done in the past have related to windows. Mm, certainly. Um, that's the, just so you guys know. That's yeah. a huge, big deal that everybody can't wrap their head around when it comes to, to residences and commercial buildings. We have better window choices now. Mm -hmm. This this building could be upgraded with appropriate windows. Um, what's your thoughts on a, that as a condition or I would do we yeah, make yeah. a condition? No, um, my my recommendation, the staff recommendation, you know, from a you know, as as a based on my experience as a historic preservation practitioner for, gosh, uh, longer than I probably care to admit, um, it's been a been a long time. Um, my recommendation would be that there not be that condition placed. You would have to review a window replacement project anyway. Oh, you know, and because it's the exterior, I'm you know, bringing it up yeah. with you guys because it no, I, we, has been it, we, a certainly a nightmare. Yes, around long enough here to know that in some cases. <laughs> Uh, but I think, as you suggest, I think doing it this way leaves it the responsibility to the future owners Correct. to come back to us and say, yeah, we can replace these windows. We can get thermal conditioning and they'll look exactly like the original. Yeah. Or as close as or, we can get, you know, which reasonably close is this. is This is what it looked like originally. This is what it's going to yeah. look like after it. Can you tell the difference? And 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 in general, it's like the 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 individuals who have contacted the city either via email or by telephone have been advised that you know windows are considered you know because some you know some people think well a window is like an interior feature and it's like well no it's also an exterior feature and so <laughs> you know it would have to be reviewed by the landmark preservation board. And so they have been advised, like anybody who's contacted the city, you know, who's in, expressed an interest in purchasing this property has been told. If you do the following types of work, you know, and, and it's clearly laid out in the Bothell Municipal Code, you know, you, know, you are going to have to get a certificate of appropriateness. And so I think leaving it open ended on in that regard, I think would be would be preferable yeah. because the exterior kind of covers everything, you know, well, it. It's been thoughtfully 
uh, maintained because yes. sometimes you can't get the exact material, but you do what you can do, and they, they've taken that into account. I actually walked the property today. Oh, good. Oh, wow, that's cool. I couldn't see through too many windows, and, and it's a challenging property because of the elevations. But um, uh, the back deck is not, you know, consistent with 1950s construction. But that's probably it a looks, good thing. It's still, as you saw from the pictures, the railing and things there are very modern type looking. They they, they didn't put up something that was clearly um, yeah. plastic mm -hmm. around it or something. Mm -hmm. So the, the decking is a, a Trex type material, but um, the rest I, of it. I would have probably approved consistent. that having been dealing with the having to replace a deck right now because yeah. even though we because we don't have tight wood anymore your 30 year recommended cedar decking is about 15 yeah if you're lucky yeah. Yeah. I was going to say close to 20 minutes but <laughs> no it's cedar I have cedar and it was we had cedar too <laughs> it didn't last very long oh man yeah, no, so I, I think, uh, you know, so I guess I can make a motion you, to. Yeah, you go ahead and make the motion. I'll uh, second it. Do I have to read all this? Uh, well, one quick thing I want to say. Um, does board, board member Salazar, do you have any any comments you would like to say? Just uh, I want to make sure that you're, you're involved if you'd like to be with the conversation. Uh, there's no comments at this time. That's OK. Thank you so much. So I'm ready. I, I need to read this entire. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, it, yeah, okay. it, it, it is a, it is a long Sorry, strip, but uh, well, uh, um, is it allowed to speak now as an audience? Because um, uh, my wife and I, my name is Hong, my wife Chi and I, uh, we are actually the uh, potential like future owner of this house, oh, and we also, so uh, yeah, we also um, graduated from architecture school. So no matter this is. Um, you know the, the landmark being approved or not we're certainly going to preserve the house and trying to understand the original intent of um, of uh, Mercado. so um i think our major question is the uh, 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 I, 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 I'm, I'm i'm sorry could you could you please hold on just one moment please we need to speak to the city attorney so sure no problem thank you opened and closed uh, you know and we've moved on to deliberations Did i they don't come in late they, Raise their virtual hand. Yeah. I mean, I understand. At this point, we're, you know, we've moved on to deliberations, and so the time for public comments is well behind us. Could we reopen? I, I'm really not recommending that you reopen, given that you've begun deliberations. I mean, yeah, you're past it. We can appreciate their comments, but it's close. I mean, Adam, have you seen somebody seen you know reopening a public hearing? Uh, I mean, I guess we could all, one of the one of the one of the option is to defer consideration of the nomination to receive additional testimony. So it's it's a bit out of order, but I mean, I suppose we would need to swear them in right. and the chair would have to reopen and reclose the hearing. Uh, do we need to, who makes the decision to reopen the hearing? Does the, does the board have to vote? Like, does someone have to make a motion to reopen the hearing to take the testimony? Yeah, so... One of their options is to, you know, one of the, the motions is to have the, the matter deferred, you know, to continue to another public hearing to be held on a certain day to receive additional testimony. Because we have that oh, one. option in the code, I suppose technically we could apply it now. It's very, it's very out of order. It's very out of order. The code doesn't really tell us what to do if we have somebody who chimes in very late now. But but because we do, I mean, I, 
it's up to the board and what they want to do if they want to reopen okay. the public hearing because they do have this deferred consideration of the nomination. So, so if we're sorry, but question so if we reopen it, we can and, and they speak, we can do it, we can we can then close it and then and then do the, like make a decision, or we have to wait until another month. No, I mean, again, the code doesn't the code does not speak to this. So I mean, it is it's extremely out of order. But I think what you should do is if if you do feel like additional testimony would having additional testimony would be valuable to the board, yeah, that's fair. you could reopen the public hearing, have them sworn in, and make sure that they have the opportunity to testify. I think it would be important to just be cognizant of the deliberation that's already occurred. Right. And put it in the appropriate context based on whatever if you decide to reopen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, so, so I'm just going to speculation here again. If I make a motion to uh, defer our decision for five minutes. So, in order to allow us to open public testimony and close public testimony, <laughs> yeah. is that is that an effective motion? I, I, I want to couch it, couch it within the terms that the code seems to allow for, even though the code doesn't specify how long it has to be deferred or. Right. I think it says. To a continued public hearing. Yeah. So, there's no motion on the table right now, so that's good. So you're not having to table any motions or anything like that. I think at this point, you could, if the board is so inclined, someone could make a motion and you could vote on the the prospect of reopening and of taking additional testimony. So, oh. can I say I'm not trying to make a testimony and uh, I don't want to interrupt the process, so. It, yeah, it, it, my my apologies, sir. Uh, it um, we it, it it's actually unfortunately we had already called for public testimony, yeah. and so we actually under our yeah I that I yeah it, it, yeah, uh, and so unfortunately we can't accept your testimony at this time unless the board chooses to reopen the public hearing. Yeah, so I don't um, what I mean is I don't want to. Uh, take any testimony now. So what I okay. just trying to say is just um, a very simple question which can be answered maybe later on. So um, okay. I don't want to interrupt the, the, the okay. process. So yeah. Um, it, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, uh, if if you would, I mean, you know, uh, if you have specific questions about if you have specific questions about, you know, what could and could not be done with the property, I would say, you know, go ahead and and email city staff, uh, you know, either Sarah, you know, myself or both, and we'll be happy to walk you through that process. Would would that be acceptable to you? Yeah, sounds good. And okay. yeah, and I I think I um, also heard to answer a question previously, like um, if the uh, the the purchaser which is us which is us like um, aware of this process uh, yeah the answer is yes we do okay just kidding um so uh, our apologies for the the uh, a, a little bit of the miscommunication thank you for understanding that you know we have a procedure that we have to adhere to uh you know because this is a, a regulated public process process and a quasi judicial hearing so thank you for your patience and uh and please uh, contact us uh by email with those additional questions thank you no problem thank you thank you okay <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, so yes, yeah, so to, to to go back, uh, yes, the motion and the findings of fact have to be read into the record. Okay. This is set up just to be just to read it. Pursuant to uh, Bothell Municipal Code 22.24.010A, the City of Bothell Landmark Preservation Board recommends that the Mikado House, located at 17823 88 Avenue Northeast in Bothell 
be designated as a city of Bothell landmark and listed in the Bothell Register of Historic Landmarks. This recommendation is based on the following findings of fact. One, pursuant to BMC 22.20.010 and BMC 22.20.020A, the current owners of the Mikado House nominated the property to be listed in the Bothell Register of Historic Landmarks on July 18, 2023. Two, pursuant to BMC 22.20.020B, the nomination form was completed on August 18, 2023, and the nomination was referred to the City of Bothell Landmark Preservation Board for their consideration during a public hearing held on September 26, 2023. Three, Pursuant to BMC 22.16.010, the Mikado House was constructed in 1958 and is more than 50 years old and is significantly associated with the history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, or cultural heritage of the community. Therefore, the Mikado House is eligible for inclusion in the Bothell Register of Historic Landmarks. Four, pursuant to BMC 22.16.101, Oh, one, oh. I'll repeat that, BMC 22.16.010, the Mikado House possesses integrity of location, design, materials, workmanship, and association. Five, pursuant to BMC 22.16.010B, the Mikado House is associated with the lives of persons significant in local, state, and national history. Six, pursuant to BMC 22.16.010D, the Makata House embodies the distinctive architectural characteristics of a type, period, style, or method of construction. Seven, pursuant to BMC 22.24.045A, the landmark designation shall apply to the exterior of the Makata House and the surrounding landscape located within the within the existing boundaries of King County Tax Assessor Parcel Number 072605-9061. Pursuant to BMC 22.24.030, this recommendation of the City of Bothell Landmark Preservation Board and these findings of fact will be forwarded to the City Bothell City Council. Additionally, pursuant to BMC 22.24.040, the current owner of the Mikado House will be notified in writing of this recommendation and these findings of fact. Thank you. Second. I second. Okay, I heard a motion and a second. So does that mean we go to a vote? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Sampi? Aye. Board Member Thomas? Aye. Board Member Salazar? Aye. Myself, aye. I'll say board member Nelson just to say it, but aye. <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. That was that was that was fun. <laughs> That's a very board member Thomas for reading. Yeah, I was going to say yes. thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you to everybody who joined in uh, from members of the public. Thank you to Tom and Penelope for their presentations. Uh, any additional follow up questions or inquiries in, in regard to the status of the proceedings this evening in regard to the McAdoo House, please email either Sarah Frost at the city or myself and uh, we will uh, we will get you the answers that you need. Uh, apologies for the little bit of a hiccup there, but uh, thank you for bearing with us. Thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who's going to close this? <laughs> that is not, I do, that is, I do I not have no, an answer for that. And, <laughs> And maybe not even just that. Somebody should let. Uh, uh, oh shoot! Who's our public relations cross, person? Um, on Channel Nine. Um, shoot. 
I, uh, the digital newspaper uh, downtown. I can't. Oh. Stranger? I hate no. it. Yeah, Stranger actually would be a good one too. No, the um, cross. I hate it when you just kind of. Tip your tongue. Cross cut. Uh, cross cut. Cross -cut. Uh, okay. Yeah. Because it's the kind of one that they really like. There is a. Uh, there was an in, there was an individual uh, who will probably uh, will drop that dime on our behalf, uh, who was on the call. Uh, Eugenia Wu, who's uh, involved with Docomomo, uh, the local chapter, uh, is also because, uh, with uh, Historic Seattle. If, and she's been aware of this. If, if there's one good way to rattle the bushes, <laughs> showing up on that. Yes. Yes. What about a good public service? So next on the agenda, we have reports from staff. Are there any reports from staff? Yes, we yes. need to discuss future meeting dates. Yes. So it has been brought up that there is um, that we would like to have one on October 24th. Yes. If if there are four, we need a quorum. <laughs> yes. So we can only host host that meeting on October 24th if there are either all four of you available and or um, mm -hmm. If somebody has responded to Kirsten's email from a couple weeks ago, um, so that would be item number one. Are y'all available? The status on, on the other board members? Is? Oh yeah, I was, uh, I was gonna ask if uh, when you sent out the email that said who can come for, to this meeting, mm -hmm. did you get like four yeses, two noes? Maybe both, maybe like five. Do you know? I guess. No. Okay. Um, I think our bylaws state that you can miss two unexcused meetings i would need to confirm that i don't know off the top of my head but do you know i did not have the bylaws yeah uh, i, I actually I, I, I should we, i won't look them up either. yeah it's not something we need to make any decisions yeah. on right now but. And, and 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 i think too i mean you know i think i think we're in a we're in like in a little bit of you know because you know ashley it was it was the staff contact for the longest period of time and, yeah. now, and now uh and now we're on board and you know we're you know still you know, trying to get a handle on some of the the, fi the finer <laughs> the finer tuned aspects of it but yeah. i mean i you know i would i would say that you know obviously we've got official communications you know that you know go through the city email address yeah but i mean that being said i think that you know we, we do need to figure out if there's a good way to just kind of do a quorum check and so that that could be something that you know mr chair you know, we we would rely on you to kind of do like just a, like e e email the to the emails of the folks essentially. Is that okay? Yeah. So I, that's not bad. With that comes the reminder to please be checking your city yeah. emails yeah. regularly. Um, I think that was sort of part of the part of the gap. But um, so there's that. So um, for all present, are you all available for October twenty fourth? Like it. Okay. I think so. I mean, I, I, that'll, I don't even plan things out ahead. So. <laughs> okay. Um, board member Salazar. Yes, I am. Awesome. Um, are we thinking that we'll need one for November or December? So I, I, I would say that we should go ahead and plan on if the board is amenable having a, com a combination you know like a like a postponed november meeting due to thanksgiving you know as board member sampi had well since it's not the tuesday oh right oh right it's yeah it's always like where is our meeting yeah what, tuesday, what was, november 28th after, okay and then this, this, year, this, this out. would be a tuesday earlier so I, I mean it would probably i mean for for all intents and purposes it would probably be december the 19th that we should reserve. And the reason for that is it's just to give people adequate time to get any any proposals. And um, I mean, I I anticipate that there there may be other things that come up, um, you know, barring any sort of formal action item that comes in uh we could also do uh like a, a like a technical briefing you know for 
the for the board you know just on a preservation topic um and you know we can do a straw poll on things that they might mm -hmm. be interested in okay. um that's also going to be right around the time that uh ashley had told me that you know the the grant cycles usually mm -hmm. open up oh, yeah, that's right. in january yeah january. and so you know we're going to be working on you know some grant applications you know so yeah uh it, you know, it might be a very brief meeting, you know, just to kind of brief the brief the board on on those activities just before the, the end of the new year. But yeah, November is problematic. I can I can tell just the way Thanksgiving <laughs> falls yeah. this yeah. year. Yeah, it falls early. Yeah, and it kind of it's bad when it falls late. It's bad when it falls late. Yeah. So December 19th would be the the other other meeting date. Are all present available for that date? I don't know yet. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, please check your calendars and let me know. We usually have some concerts and things about that time, so I don't know yet. Try to Monday or Wednesday, maybe leave Tuesday open, but <laughs> I need to start kind of working again in December. Okay. Um, I believe that is all I have from staff. Okay. Well, thank you. Do we have any reports from our members? I'll give it one more second. Um, we have we have a special meeting coming up, don't we? Uh, in October or September. That's that October twenty fourth. Yeah. Yeah. It's in regard to the uh, comp plan. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, seeing no other reports. Oh, so that will just be our regular meeting time. Correct. Pretty much. Who's the Who's going to be the lead? Is that, is that Kirsten? Mm, probably. On comp plan? Yeah. Okay. Um, feel free to if yeah, CC me or and or. Kirsten, if okay. we need to Kirsten. be in touch on that. I always one. mispronounce her name. I feel so bad about cover it. Some Kirsten. more information on the, the comprehensive plan. Yeah. I don't. It, yeah, so actually, I, I appreciate you uh, bringing that up uh, because I, I did want to, you know, now that now that the board has acted on the McAdoo nomination, I can talk about this because the McAdoo nomination also helped satisfy the telling Bothell's full story deliverables. Um, and so uh, the grant administrate the grant administrator with Four Culture actually got in contact me with uh, contact with me last week. And so she just recently inherited the administration of the telling Bothell's full story contract. And so we talked about that a little bit and about what the timing for getting those deliverables in would be. And the other thing that we talked about was also like uh, for culture, you know, in, in case anybody did not see for culture uh, uh, issued a, if I recall correctly, it was an $8,000 emergency grant to uh, fund or help defray the costs that the city incurred in preparing the McAdoo nomination. Yeah, very, very generous grant. And it was like, my understanding is it was just like unanimous. You know, they were just like, yes, That's for great. yes, for goodness sakes, like, you know, give them the I mean, grant. And we've, so we've been beholden to them for a number of years on a number of things, but we've also tried to produce for it. Exactly. And so the fantastic thing is, is that the major question that the for culture had about the McAdoo nomination was what's the public benefit? And so the public benefit is, is that the nomination is now going to be posted publicly online on the city website. And so it's available for all to see mm -hmm. and it's public information. And so it, it's got a very, very clear public benefit. And it would probably it's eventually also going to get posted on the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation's wizard, you know, database. Okay. So that being said, cross yeah, crosscut. Yeah. So Tell, uh, telling Bothell's full story, uh, one of the things that I, I, just to give you an update, you know, from the staff uh, in regard to telling Bothell's full story, um, the, uh, w there is a, 
a work product that is eventually going to need to be produced for telling Bothell's full story. And so the some of the contextual information that was gathered in preparation of the McAdoo nomination also serves the double purpose of helping satisfy telling Bothell's full story. Because all of a sudden we've got we have a black context that we did not have before. And now we have it. And so uh, I have discussed, uh, you know, on a very, very tentative preliminary basis with Tom and Penelope that we we can because we started looking through census records. There are uh, there are so far we've identified Filipino or Filipina uh, individuals, black individuals, and preliminarily have identified uh, some Japanese families as well. And so there there's additional research that needs to be done to kind of button up, you know, all of this, you know, to, into a into something that provides that public benefit, you know, a context statement, as it were. And so that is what we're looking at, you know, preparing in relatively short order so that we can we can close out the telling Bothell's full story, um, you know, because it has been going on for a long time. It's not to say that the activities will not continue, but, you know, at some point we will have to uh, apply for the funding from for culture uh, to, you know, fund that effort. So what what does for culture and, and your team mm -hmm. envision as a product for public consumption? I mean, previously, when we were doing this with for culture for 10 years, right, right, we produced the book and the video. Right. Video first. And then we went, hey, we got all this information. Let's put it in a book. Yeah, I think that, you know, at this point, it has to be something that's commensurate with the grant, which is thirty three hundred dollars. And so we're thinking that it's going to be. Uh, like the context statement is going to be a similar product, like the context statement that's on the Bothell website currently. Uh, you know, dated with citations, you know, updated. Um, we are. Does that include on the website? Oh, that's not, is that? It's the uh, that what's early the Bothell public? history. Yes, yeah, the, the, the public facing document that, yeah, that currently. That people can see yeah, in the yeah. role and right. it's on the, the TV. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that it was something that was visible. Correct, correct. When, when the. That's one of our that mandates. was first brought to our attention as a project. Wasn't there a national organization that was providing much more substantial funding? Than, than there, than yeah, th there was. I mean, and it's getting it, it's, it's yeah, and I and I and getting I, the award that right, right, and I th and my understanding is is that all that we we you know all the work, the contract that we're currently under because we're not. Uh, the contract that we're currently under was for the $3,300 grant from for culture. So, so more to come on that, but I just wanted to update everyone on so, you know, that. Nothing uh, has turned up as far as any Native American. Um, no, no. Yeah, it's um, mute. Because that, that was... Uh, That was the reason I came on this morning in the first place, and and it's it's been. Is that sort kind of, of because historically, because we don't have the reservation in this area that. I I think that there's probably many many complicated oh, reasons I'm sure for that. There's a number of complicated yeah. reasons. Yeah. Um, and I. Usually is for. And I and it's it's also something that. Uh, we we have a, a we have a cultural ethnographer, you know, who works for our company, but she's only recently started, uh, and so there are other knowledgeable individuals who can speak, you know, much more, you know, to that. Um, there are existing public historic context statements for the 
native people's history um, that are out there that pertain to Bothell. Um, but it's uh, as far as specific sites, that's restricted. Oh yeah. And so it can't be it can't be shared publicly. And so that's that's what we're. I know, you know. We, we butt up against that regularly, but that's. But the site locations are not as significant as what the site locations tell us. <laughs> right. I mean, and, and unfortunately, I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm an, an extreme disadvantage, uh, you know, because the the way that cultural resources management is handled is the archaeologists address native peoples and and it's uh it has and a lot of it has to do with uh, uh native sovereignty yeah. and so and the landscape has changed in even the past several years so um but to summarize there are individuals who are more knowledgeable that would be able to speak to the board on an official basis if they are you know, so interested. It it would be helpful because it would be really nice, and it, and it's more than nice, but nice is the only word I got to be able to address the facts that this was a well used Native American neighborhood, mm -hmm. and that needs to be acknowledged in what we put out there as part of our history on each of these properties in in our park down here at the landing in our trails and and i would like to see a connect you know one of the things in the comp plan is how do we connect our trail system mm -hmm. with our rivers and some of our neighborhoods uphill and downhill because we have several hills. Right. You know, as, as one of our former directors, <laughs> seven hills of Bothell, and I ride my bike up all of them. Uh, but it, it would be really nice to have a context to refer to that and then bring it into uh, an acknowledgement of that along these trails. Yeah. Um... I think yes, it's a future project. I've, but it's an important one. But it's a very, yeah. very important one, and we need to get started on it, so to speak. Yeah. No, I. I so we need their guidance because okay, if we can only say this much, where can we say it? Because we don't want to infringe on your archaeological uh, toes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and. How do we inculcate this into our neighborhoods and our region, our community overall, so that people understand this? Because they need to know. And it, you know, and there's, you know, there have been staff discussions, you know, uh, you know, with the with the members of the community development department about the best way to address that. And there is a city DEI, you know, coordinator. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the, there have, there have been previous, you know, attempts, you know, well-intentioned attempt to request tribes comment. Um, but part of the rise in tribal sovereignty is that tribes are sovereign governments that other governments need to contact and not just citizens and th and this is information that we're getting straight from the tribes <laughs> no, I, yeah I, uh, yeah at this point i totally understand where yeah. they're coming from yeah at least to from my position i i get that yeah. So, so we need their help and we need well, I know I know Kenmore too. initiated with the um, assistance of a um, Native American advisor 
a letter from the council mayor to uh, tribal councils and leadership in terms of uh, initiating a discussion that would develop a work group um, that um, would be from both communities members. Um, and I think to a certain extent led uh, by uh, a tribal member. Uh, and I have lost track of how that's proceeded. Uh, but I know it was initiated and I know there were there were, there were some renaming things that happened, but I don't know if anything more has progressed there in terms of um, their history or joint projects, restoration projects, um, arts. Yeah. It sounds like something Bothell could probably do pretty well, at least reach out. I mean, if Kenmore did it, I'm sure we could do it. I don't, you know. Well, I, I'd want to, you know, explore a little bit what what's the most effective pathway? What yeah, worked, no, that's true too. What's worked and, for communities, what's right. worked for tribal bodies in terms of that outreach. We have a resource in our community uh, who is the legislative liaison tribes, and that's their example. Yeah. Um, so and that, it would be really nice too when you talk about some of the renaming that that, that would be acknowledged that, I mean, we have North Creek, Swamp Creek, we have these other areas. We know full well that that is oh, right, this, right, right, right. This valley was called, or this this creek, or or that this and that. And I, you know, you're, we're seeing a little bit of it on the East Coast where they're acknowledging and and doing the dual naming. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. You know, even in our community, if we can at least acknowledge and start to do that, it makes kids aware, it makes adults aware that this is part of our whole. Yeah, well, they're part of our history, obviously. Yeah, I mean, so in conclusion, I mean, it is definitely. The environment has changed and so it's. I mean, first and foremost, the most important thing is closing out the grant so that we don't have a sword of Damocles, you know, over our head. Um, and that there is a work product that people can use. Um, but uh, yeah, so stay tuned. More more to come because uh, I, I need to I need to get someone who's an archaeologist or a cultural ethnographer to to speak more eloquently to that because I probably just made a total hash of it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a very, very, very complicated issue. So thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. <laughs> so I think there's no more reports from members I'm taking. Okay. Yep. There's a motion to return. Can we need a vote then? A second. We'll have a second first and then we'll go to the vote. Second. Councilmember Sampi makes the motion to adjourn. Councilmember uh, Thomas seconds. Uh, okay, well, now we'll take a vote. Councilmember Salazar? Aye. Councilmember Thomas? Aye. Councilmember Sampi? Aye. Councilmember Nell, or board member, excuse me, board member Nelson? Aye. Brilliant. And I'm Thank going you. to end the recording. And um, that will essentially close out the team's meeting. So apologies for the uh, abrupt. abrupt goodbye. <laughs> thank so, you, Paul, thank for you being guys. here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Andrew. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.